Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our Distinguished Speakers Series lecture for today. And we're delighted to, uh, to be featuring one of, uh, one of the world's most prominent economists to speak to us about the world economy and its outlook today. Obviously, as we look ahead in 2011, uh, the fate of the world economy is one of the things that most preoccupies us. The Lowy Institute's own Mark Thelwell describes the current world economy as a two-speed world economy. Currently, we have uh, the wealthy economies, the pres present company uh, excused, uh, featuring a depressing tale of high unemployment, sluggish growth, high debt, low interest rates, and anemic currencies. On the other hand, among emerging eco economies in what we used to call the third world, it's a story of booming growth, plummeting poverty, investment surges, the rapid uptake of communications technology, inflation fears, and underpriced currencies. So to look ahead to the world economy, uh, we have one of, one of uh, the world's leading economists to come and speak to us today, Nomura Securities, uh, Richard Koo. Richard Koo is Chief Economist at Nomura, at Nomura Research Institute, the research arm of Nomura Securities. Before joining Nomura, he was an economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and was a doctoral fellow of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He has been repeatedly voted one of the most reliable economists by Japanese uh, capital and financial market players for nearly a decade has advised successive prime ministers on how best to deal with Japan's economic and banking problems and is the only non-Japanese member of the Defence Strategy Study Conference of the uh, Japanese Ministry uh, of Defence. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please join me in welcoming Richard Koo. Well, good afternoon. It's an honour to be here. Uh, as, as many of you are aware, there's quite a bit of confusion out there as to what is the right thing to do in the United States, in Europe, UK, all of these uh, places where there should be more fiscal stimulus or less fiscal stimulus, more monetary stimulus, less fiscal stimulus, more capital injection to the banks or, or less, uh, what to do with all these rating agencies trying to downgrade you. All of these problems and the debate that goes with it, attendant confusion that goes with it, we went through in Japan 15 years ago. Every one of them. And so what I like to do today is to go through what's been happening around the world with a view from Japan. That is that how we manage that debate and what were the right answers given what we went through. Now, <clears throat> this title, what uh, Europe, China, US can learn from Japan infuriates a lot of people, actually. <laughs> and you know why? Because of, what can we learn from Japan? Japan did everything wrong, so slow in structural reform, never uh, wrote of all these problem loans, and kept on uh, postponing the, the inevitable. That's why they took 15 years to come out. Well, there was a huge amount of misreporting on what actually happened to Japan, and I will get to it uh, shortly. But in order to first start uh, to get those people understand our predicament, I usually start with this chart, which shows what happened to Japanese house prices and the US house prices 15 years apart. And the heavy line is the Case-Shiller Index, that's the uh, housing price index that people often uh, looked at during this period, and the two thin lines are what happened to Tokyo area and Osaka area house prices exactly 15 years earlier. And as you can see on the way up and on the way down, both the magnitude and the durations are remarkably similar. And even those hard-nosed Americans shut up after they see this chart. So, oh my gosh, we were not all that different after all. And not only that, this chart was put on the web like two years ago, and that was without my permission, actually. Uh, one Washington think tank, CSIS, if you know those people, uh, I give a little talk, and then this was put on the, on the web. And so many people in the US housing market have seen this chart that just a six months later, 
when I was in Boston talking about these issues, someone came up to me and they said, do you know why U.S. house prices stabilized here? Because so many people have seen this chart and says, oh, <laughs> Japanese will stop buying, so maybe it's okay to buy. Well, I think he was giving me far too much credit for, for this chart, but it does look remarkably similar. And once the bubble burst, central banks all around the world dropped rates very sharply. Federal Reserve, where I used to work, dropped rates at the fastest rate in Federal Reserve's history, now exactly the same rate as in Japan. UK did the same. Uh, ECB, the European Central Bank, also brought rates down. These rates are the lowest in their country's histories. But I would argue that they have had remarkably little benefit to the economies. After all, as you all of you are aware, unemployment, employment or unemployment pictures in all of these economies are still very, very poor. This is the U.S. economy. Industrial production is coming back up to the level of 2005. But when you look at the employment picture, well, this, this was printed before Friday last week. Uh, it's it's not right now at 9.0%, 9, 9 but still, for an economy which is supposed to be very interest sensitive, U.S. economy, uh, when I was running these models in the United States, uh, we, we tend to say that U.S. economy is far more interest sensitive than those traditional economies in Europe or in, uh, or in Japan. U.S. had zero interest rates for full two years. And this is what's been happening to the employment. You know, we should be seeing three or four bubbles by now. And housing prices should be going through the roof. It's just not the case. House prices are still falling. Europe, similar picture. Industrial production after the Lehman shock recovered to the level of 2005, but unemployment rate still double digit. And even this chart is somewhat misleading because only one country in Europe is actually doing very well, and that's Germany. This is the industrial production for these economies. German industrial production is back to the level of 2006, close to their previous peak. But when you look at the other three, French production is level of 1997, Italy 1994, Spain 1997. So they have a long way to go before they are anywhere near where they were back in 2007 or 2006. And Japan, well, we are not the epicenter of this, this, uh, this mess. There was no bubble in Japan, but industrial production fell to the level of 1983, February of 2009. And you wonder, why did Japan get uh, hit so badly? Well, Japan has been concentrating building in the, uh, durable products, or the parts to build durable products, or the capital equipment to build durable products. That's where Japan was very good at. And if you look at the pattern of consumption around the world, not just in the US, but all around the world, the, the consumption that collapsed following Lehman shock was all in durable goods. So car sales, appliance sales, all dropped. And so because Japan was so heavily into uh, producing durable goods, we were proportionally hit more than those countries that are not <clears throat> involved in building uh, durable goods. And well, we are back to the level of 2003. This little decline is a result of the uh, expiration of some of these government programs encouraging people to buy uh, fuel efficient cars, fuel efficient appliances. But we are kind of recovering from that. But you know, the picture is quite similar to, to other parts of the world. Well, why did these remarkably low rates fail to produce the kind of response we expect from monetary easing? Well, for monetary policy to work, there has to be people out there borrowing money. That is to say, when central bank lowers interest rates, people must say, ah, this rates, maybe I can do something with it, and then go to the bank, borrow money, and spend it, and then the economy moves forward. Well, what this chart shows is that the Federal Reserve asked its, its banks, what's been happening to demand for funds from the private sector? Are the private sector sources trying to borrow money or trying to pay back debt, compared to three months ago? So because the way it is asked, compared to three months ago, any entry less than zero means people are trying to pay back debt. Anything above zero means they're trying to uh, increase their borrowings. And when you look at this chart, during the bubble days, of course, there was a very strong demand for funds. But once the bubble burst, you see that even with zero interest rates, that's the, the circled area, even with zero interest rates, demand for funds fell, 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 and it's finally 
return to zero means it's finally stopped falling, which means the level now is very, very low. And if people are trying to pay back debt with the zero interest rates, there's absolutely no reason why monetary policy should work. Now, all these zero interest rates, quantitative easing, all of that is basically irrelevant because no one's borrowing money. And as a former central banker myself, who once believed in monetary policy, that's why I worked at the Federal Reserve in New York, this is a very sad state of affairs in that even with zero interest rates, people are not borrowing money. Same picture in Europe, uh, demand for funds fell, 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 and it's finally beginning to, to recover a bit. But you have to realize that the level of demand now is very, very low, and it's just showing a little recovery. This world where even if with zero interest rates or near zero interest rates, demand for fund remains very weak or stays negative, is the world we found ourselves in Japan for the last 20 years. This is, the, this is how much money Japanese companies procured from both the capital market and the banking system, how much money they borrowed from the, those two areas. During the bubble days, late 80s, you can see the demand for funds uh, growing very, very sharply, people investing in all sorts, uh, all sorts of assets, thinking that they're gonna make tons of money. And because the economy was kind of overheating, Bank of Japan was uh, tightening the short-term interest rates all the way to 8% when the inflation rate was less than two, uh, trying to cool the economy down. Then on 1990, 1991, the bubble burst, and you see demand for funds falling and falling and falling. Bank of Japan, realizing that the economy is weakening, brought rates down all the way from 8% to nearly zero by 1995. But look what happens afterwards. The demand fund goes negative with zero interest rates for full 10 years, from 1995 all the way to uh, 2005. We never learned this in universities, right? Companies are not supposed to pay down debt when interest rates are zero. They should be borrowing and investing. So why, why did something like this happen? Full 10 years. Well, the answer is quite simple. Those people who bought assets here with borrowed funds, the asset prices collapsed, liabilities remained, and people realized that their balance sheet's underwater. They're bankrupt. You bought these assets with 100 million, the asset is not only worth 20 million, but your debt is still 80 million, so you're 60 million underwater. Now, balance sheets underwater means you're bankrupt, but there are actually two types of bankruptcies when you think about it. The one without cash flow and the one with cash flow. The one without cash flow is that you came out with this new car, you try to sell it, but the public doesn't like it. You try to put in more advertisement expenditures trying to sell this car, but still no, to, to no avail, then eventually you, you run out of cash and you go bankrupt. In that case, whatever you put up to the, uh, whatever you produce is no longer valued by the society, so you better leave the scene. There's no two ways about it, you're gone. But suppose you are still, your cars and cameras are still selling very well. But because of the investment decisions, poor investment decisions made in the 19, late 80s, your balance sheet is underwater. And if you remember, during this period, Japan was running one of the largest trade surpluses in the world. In fact, this period was the largest in the world. The consumers all around the world, some from Australia, wanted to buy Japanese cars, Japanese cameras. So the cash flow was there, but the balance sheets were underwater, bankrupt. Now, if you are in that situation, what is the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do, whether you're Australian or Japanese or Taiwanese or American, the right thing to do is to use the cash flow to pay down debt. Because you don't want to tell your bankers that, sorry, it's all non-performing loans. You don't want to tell your shareholders, sorry, you have no, it's all piece of paper now. And you, don't, you certainly don't want to tell your workers that you have no more jobs tomorrow. So for all the stakeholders of the firm involved, the right thing to do is to use the cash flow to pay down debt because it, asset prices never go negative, so if you continue to pay down debt, at some point your balance sheet will be balanced again. You say, Phew, I'm out of this problem, now you're gonna go after the competitors uh, again. So that's basically what happened here. The entire Japanese business community was engaged in balance sheet repair. And on some of the bigger years, the amount of debt repayment was over 30 trillion yen a year. That's 6% of Japan's GDP. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, 
even though the right thing to do is to repair your balance sheets with your cash flow at, at the micro level, when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter a completely different world. And to understand what I mean by this, let me give you a numerical example of what the ordinary economy looks like, what they teach you in the universities. In the ordinary world, if I'm a member of the household sector and I have $1,000 of income and I decide to say I'll spend $900 and decide to save the $100, the $900 is already someone else's income. So this is not a problem. The $100 that I decide to save will go through people like us, Nomura, or financial sector, and it's given to someone else who can use it. And that person borrows it and spends it. <clears throat> so you have 900 plus 100 against the original income of $1,000, and the economy moves forward. And if there are too many borrowers, interest rates are raised. Too few borrowers, interest rates are lowered. At the end of the day, the entire $100 is borrowed and spent. That's how the normal economy is supposed to operate. But in this world, rates are zero and people are still paying down debt as a, as a group. So when the debt repayment and all these household savings come into the banks, they have no one to lend this money to. So it just gets stuck in a banking system. So going back to my numerical example, I get $1,000 of income. I decide to spend $900 and decide to save $100. The $900 is already someone else's income. That's not a problem. But this $100 gets stuck in the banking system. Because in this situation, they cannot lend to anybody, even with zero interest rate, and you cannot bring rates any lower than zero. So only $900 are spent, and so economy shrinks from 1000 to 900 Now that 900 is someone else's income, when that person says, okay, let's save 10%, that person spends $810 and decides to save $90, the $90 gets stuck in the banking system too, because this goes on for 10 years. So if, we, if no action is taken in this situation when private sector is minimizing debt, economy could shrink from 1,000, 900, 810, 730 very, very quickly, even with zero interest rates. And you may wonder, gee, something like that could actually happen? Well, when you go back and look at what happened during the United States uh, during the Great Depression, that was exactly this pattern that all these people who were in the stock market and other markets prior to October 1929 were in there with borrowed money. And once the market collapsed, they realized that their li liability is too much relative to their assets. Everybody started paying down debt all at the same time, but there was no one on the other side borrowing and spending money. So the US fell into this 1,900, 810, 730 process. In just four years, the United States lost 46% of its GDP, unemployment rate well about 25%, well over 50% in major cities. So something like this could actually happen. Well, then what happened to the Japanese GDP during this period? And you have heard all these recession and, and so forth, but if when you look at the actual Japanese GDP, which is these two lines, nominal and the real GDP, you notice that during the entire period, Japanese GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble. This horizontal line indicates the peak of the bubble, and uh, this, this is a kind of a symbolic Mount Fuji. That's it's not such a pretty thing after all. It's uh, what happened to Japanese commercial real estate prices. And in a Japanese case, it's the commercial real estate that led the bubble. Housing prices followed. Uh, when the <clears throat> commercial real estate prices were skyrocketing, people felt rich, spent a lot of money, and GDP went up very sharply. That one, anyone can explain. It's a no-brainer, but what's remarkable about the Japanese experience is what happened afterwards. The bubble burst and real, commercial real estate prices collapsed to the level of 1973. 87% decline from the peak. Now just imagine Sydney prices down 87, Perth down 87, Brisbane down 87, Melbourne down 87. What kind of economy do you think you have left here? Right, you can imagine. And then you see that Japanese GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble when the entire Japanese private sector was deleveraging, paying down debt to the tune of 6% of GDP. And then on top of that, there's a Japanese households saving money, perhaps to the 4% of GDP. And the, 
entire GDP not falling below the peak of the bubble. When you think about it, that was quite a remarkable achievement. How did we do it? Well, the answer was very simple. Government borrowed $100 and spent it. If government comes in and borrowed $100, it will be 900 plus $100,000 against, against the original income of the $1,000. There's no reason for GDP to fall. The next year, the same thing happens. Household saving money, companies not borrowing money. Why same thing happens year after year after year? Well, if asset prices fall 87% from the peak, it would take five years, seven years for average companies to repair uh, their balance sheets. If you're unlucky enough, unlucky enough to have bought at the peak, it may take 20 years before your balance sheet is repaired. But as long as you have cash flow, you continue to repair your balance sheets. So year after year after year, same thing happens. And we were lucky to have liberal Democrats running the government, we're highly liberal with public spending. And so as soon as the economy began to weaken, they said, oh, let's build roads, let's build bridges. Thinking that that would be sufficient to get the, the pump priming going and the economy on, on the growth trajectory. But every time the fiscal stimulus was removed, the economy tanked again because the private sector was deleveraging the whole period. As a result, this is what happened to government spending, and this is the tax revenue. Even though GDP was maintained because asset prices fell so much, tax revenue also fell. And the gap between the two is, of course, the budget deficit. And when you add all these numbers together from 1990 to 2005, uh, 2005 because that's the time the corporate debt repayment stopped, it adds up to 460 trillion. That's 92% of Japan's GDP. No peanuts. And a lot of people are worried that you know, this thing can sink Japan because the budget deficit or the public debt is so large. But I would argue that this is a money very well spent. Because when you go back to this chart and try to imagine what might have happened to the Japanese GDP without the government action, with everybody paying down debt, no one borrowing money, asset prices down 87%, chances are high that GDP would have at least returned to the level before the bubble. And it could have fallen way below to basement two or something, if the Great Depression is any guide. But suppose it fell to the level of 1985, a year before the bubble began, and kind of stabilized there, it's, which is an optimistic assumption in itself. If you compare this GDP against what actually happened, meaning the area between these two lines, it's well over 2,000 trillion. So basically, Japanese spent 460 trillion to buy GDP worth 2,000. It's not a bad deal. Now, you don't hear this very often, because somehow those journalists came up with the conclusion that even if Japanese government did absolutely nothing, it would be 0% growth. So they're kind of assuming that everything starts from here. And then Japanese government spent 460 trillion yen, GDP only went up by that much. Wow, what a wasteful spending. And they, those people had nothing better to do, went around the country with a microscope and found a few bridges to nowhere, a few roads to nowhere, and they say, wow, this is how money was wasted. I don't think they should be measuring from this line. They should be measuring from this line. And once you, you measure it from this line, you realize how important those spendings were. Well, so the first thing the Japanese proved, the key lesson from Japan is that when you have this kind of situation, where asset prices uh, collapsing and then everybody in the private sector no longer maximizing profits, actually minimizing debt, and the economy collapsing as well, the correct remedy is to use fiscal spending. Government borrowing and spending, the excess savings in the private sector, borrow the $100, put that back into the income stream. Then you can keep the GDP from falling. GDP from falling means private sector has the income. And they can use the income to pay down debt, and slowly you come out of this mess. This lesson was actually learned by uh, global leaders in this emergency G20 meeting that took place in November of 2008, two months after Lehman collapsed in Washington, DC. At that time, Prime Minister Aso of Japan used this chart to convince the other 18 members of G20 that, look, we experienced 87% decline and we were able to keep our GDP from falling. 
The world hasn't experienced anything like 87% decline. If all of us put in a fiscal stimulus, we should be able to stabilize the world economy. And at, at the beginning, there was some, uh, some suspicion, I understand, but at the end, everybody agreed to do it. So United States, Australia, all the countries put in the fiscal stimulus, and we were able to arrest this uh, sharp collapse following uh, the Lehman shock. That was all very good, but there's actually two parts to the Japanese lesson. The first part is this one, which was very good. Uh, fiscal stimulus was in, economy recovered. But the second part is that, and this one, I don't think Mr. Aso had a chance to talk about this in G20 uh, back in November 2008, and that is that you have to maintain this fiscal stimulus until private sector balance sheets are repaired, which makes perfect sense, right? If you put a plug in the middle, and then if the private sector sorts are still deleveraging, from the moment you pull the plug, the economy will start uh, entering 1,900, 810, that, that process. And we learned this the hard way. There are two areas of significant negative growth during this period. This is 1997, this is 2001. 1997, Prime Minister Hashimoto, against my best advice, decided to cut budget deficit. And at that time, the IMF, OECD, those people who know nothing about anything, <laughs> at least in those days, oh, I know I'm taped, so I better be careful, uh, <clears throat> told the Japanese government that you have an aging population, you build bridges to nowhere, roads to nowhere, you're wasting all this money, why don't you cut it? And I told the prime minister, no, you don't cut. If you cut, the whole thing will come crashing down. But you know, I'm just a, a private sector economist, not even Japanese, right? And all these big shots from around the world were telling Japan to cut. So he did. Raise taxes, cut spending, quite substantially at that. And guess what? We have five quarters of negative growth complete meltdown of the banking system, and we ended up increasing our budget deficit instead of uh, decreasing it. This is what happened to our budget deficit. Budget deficit is the, the purple-blue line, and the tax receipts are this white line. Tax receipts collapsed, and budget deficit increased, increased by 68%. And it took Japan nearly 10 years to bring this thing down. So once you make this one mistake, you know, the recovery takes a very long time. And we made another mistake, which was unbelievable, but in 2001, Prime Minister Koizumi also tried to rhyme on budget deficit by uh, coming up with this idea of limiting the issuance of Japanese government bonds to 30 trillion a year, that's 6% of Japan's GDP. I mean, 6% GDP is already pretty large, but at that time, the deleveraging by the Japanese companies were bigger than that. And on top of this, on year two, uh, 2000, so-called IT bubble burst, and that pushed uh, all the economy down as well. And so he was not able to make, uh, maintain this goal. Economy began to weaken, budget deficit increased as well. So the point is, when the private sector is deleveraging, you never want to, you never want your government to go toward fiscal consolidation because then both sides will be trying to reduce their deficit, the whole economy will come crashing down, and you end up worse off than when you started out with. That's the lesson that is not learned yet around the world. So the Americans are now saying, with the Republicans controlling the House, uh, House of Congress, saying, now we don't want a big government, initial fiscal policy already worked, uh, pump priming is, is uh, happening, economy is recovering, so now, now is the time to cut. In Europe, they're saying, well, initially we allow the fiscal stimulus, but there's a Maastricht treaty that says the budget deficit can never be over 3% of GDP. We are all well over 3%, let's cut it. And that's where I'm seeing problems uh, around the world. Because if private sector in the US, private sector in, the, in Europe are not deleveraging, then of course that's the right thing to do. But if they're still deleveraging, and if the government tries to cut, the whole thing can uh, come crashing down. And I'm afraid that's basically what's happening in Spain and Ireland, and possibly soon in the UK. This is the Spanish flow of funds, and 
I have to explain how this data is put together for those people who are not familiar with flow of funds data. There's a horizontal line going across at zero. Above zero, we call a financial surplus, are the people saving money. Below zero, financial deficit, the word I think is somewhat unfortunate, but it means people who are borrowing and investing money. And there are four lines here, G government line, corporate line, household line, and the rest of the world. This is basically the trade balance. And if you add the four lines together, you're supposed to get zero. So what this sh chart shows is that in each of these years, who saved money and who borrowed it? That's basically what this chart shows. And when you look at the Spanish situation, the government was actually above zero during the bubble days, meaning that they were running budget surplus. And then once the bubble burst, economy collapsed, and then government line went deeply into the deficit region. And that's the deficit a lot of people are upset about. Wow, Spain is running such a large budget deficit. The country is bankrupt. All, all that kind of talk comes from this movement from here to here. Well, it's correct that budget deficit is, is very large in Spain at the moment. But when you look at what's been happening to the private sector savings in Spain, they're going in the opposite direction, in a massive way. This is the private sector households. Households are borrowing money because they were bought below zero uh, during the bubble days. Now they are well into the positive range, meaning the entire household sector is saving money. Corporate sector, well below zero during the bubble days. Now they're above zero. Above zero means the entire corporate sector is paying down debt. If you add these two lines together, it's 17% of Spanish GDP, meaning 17% of Spanish domestic demand just disappeared. So GDP would have fallen 17% if this was left unattended. Against that, the government went from here to here, meaning that the government borrowed and spent 11.3% of GDP. So private sector is increasing their savings, and government took some of the savings, borrowed it, and spent it. But this is far smaller than that one. So viewed relative to what has been happening to the private sector savings, government budget deficit in Spain, in my view, is not large enough to stabilize the Spanish economy. So if you just look at one side of it, you will say, well, oh my God, Spanish uh, deficit is large. But if you view it together with what's been happening to the private sector in Spain, it's not large enough. It should be larger in order to stabilize the Spanish economy. And as you know, because this is not large enough, Spain is experiencing unemployment rate over 20% now. It's a very sad state of affairs. And on top of this, Spain, Spanish government is forced into even more fiscal consolidation. Everybody's telling Spain to cut more budget deficit. But if, if the private sectors are doing what they're doing now, and if government tries to cut even more, the economy will shrink even further, and the budget deficit could increase even more, just like what happened to us in Japan 1997. And so what's been happening to Spain and all the policy debate in Europe, I'm not encouraged at all. And exactly the same thing is happening in Ireland. Irish government was running a uh, budget surplus prior to the bursting of the bubble. And once the bubble burst, the budget deficit increased uh, very sharply, even more so than in Spain. And people are get, getting very upset. Uh, uh, Ireland is bankrupt. We need to reschedule all of these arguments. But when you look at what, what's been happening to the Irish private sector, they were deleveraging even more than the private sector in Spain. You add the, those two private sector lines together, it's over 21% of Span uh, Irish GDP. And this number, unfortunately, is much larger than that one. That means the deflationary gap is maintained. And Spanish GDP, uh, Irish GDP, as you know, is doing very, very poorly. It's actually nearly 20% down from the peak. It's a Great Depression scenario already. And Irish government is increasingly forced to cut budget deficit even more which means they are in a, what I would call, vicious cycle. And because it's in a vicious cycle, investors get scared. The Irish government is trying to cut budget deficit. Economy weakens further. Budget deficit increases instead of decreasing. 
And then the investor gets scared. They demand more risk premium buying Irish government bonds. So so-called CDS spreads, bond yield, they are all going up instead of going down, even though government is trying to cut budget deficit. So this is uh, very much a vicious cycle. But unfortunately, in Europe, at the moment, reducing the deficit is the only game in town. No one is looking at these private sector lines. They're only looking at this government line and getting very upset. And so I don't think we will come out of the situation anytime soon.